Awesome. So thanks, Elisa. Um, so guys, I, w- I want to introduce you to a little boy I once knew. Um, this, this, uh, this little boy's name was Philip. The name that was given to him in the orphanage he came from the Philippines in 1989. Philip's father was Joseph. His mother was Flor. And they came from a very poor part of the Philippines called Malabon. Joseph worked as a gardener for, for a rich family in Metro uh, Manila, Philippines, and Floor was a domestic helper. Floor and Joseph were not able to raise their son due to extreme poverty that their families had come from. Upon his birth, it was decided that he would be given up for adoption for a better life. It is interesting, but in this moment, he, when he was given up for adoption, he was wounded a primal wound that was formed from the severing of the connection from his biological mother through adoption. As an innocent child as he was, the primal wound that he had to bear for the rest of his life manifested in a sense of mistrust, emotional and behavioural issues and, and issues that caused problems later on in life with his relationships. Philip was fortunate. He was adopted by a kind and loving family, Basil and Mary Natoli from Melbourne, Australia. Basil was a special needs teacher for the blind and also a passionate gardener himself. Mary was a district nurse and attended to patients at their homes. And in September 1989, the couple went to the Philippines to pick up this bundle of joy. As they arrived in the orphanage and met Philip for the first time and welcome him into their family. They looked down into the cot and saw this Filipino little boy staring up at them. With a boil on the right side of his head, they knew that they had fell in love. From from that moment onwards, Philip's life had changed. Even his name changed, the name that he was given in the orphanage. See, Philip's name changed to Joseph. See, I am Joseph, born into poverty and an an international adoptee. I was adopted, I was nine pounds, six ounces. The weight of a newborn baby. Unnourished and tiny, I was labelled a failure to thrive. An unfair label, but a label nonetheless and something that I had to bear for the rest of my life. Growing up as, a, as a, the eldest of three kids, I was in and out of trouble. I gave my parents a run for their money. I was in and out of trouble with the law. I had problems. I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. I was involved in gangs. The, the people I hanged around with later on in life, the older older people that I hang around with, got committed for murder. And there was a turning point in my life where I nearly got locked up in what we call juvie or juvenile jail for grand theft auto, stealing a car and driving it without a license at the age of 15. And it was at this point, my parents were at at the end of their straw. They didn't know what to do. They had no idea what to do. They sent me to places, to anger management, counselling appointments. But what they weren't doing is that they weren't addressing the issue, the core issue. And those core issues were the primal wounds. So they had no other choice. And I remember my parents, my dad saying to me, look, if you go, if you either keep going the way you're going down, you're going to end up in prison. Otherwise, we've got a ticket for you to the Philippines. See, I've been going back and forth from the Philippines for many years. They wanted me to be connected uh, to the Philippines. But this wasn't a holiday. This was a trip for three months to shake me out of that cage. I did charity work in the Philippines. Months before I got to the Philippines, there was a typhoon. And one, and I did some charity work in a hospital. I met this gentleman who was a little bit older than I was, I was 15 at the time, this gentleman was 18. He told me a story about how he 
he was family was in in a building and the typhoon hit and completely flattened the building the only way he was able to to to, to save his his siblings was he heard his his uh, youngest in the family cry call out for help and with his hands he had to dig through the rubble to find her See, at this point, I realized for me that even though I was doing charity work, I had went through the slums. I remember another thing that I want to share just before I move on is I was, I went in this, when I, one of the, one of the things that I did do is I, when I did uh, charity work in the slums, I remember walking through and looking down and I was, had to watch where I was stepping. It was underneath me. There was wood and there was a river going underneath and there was trash everywhere. I remember walking through trying to, um, you know, hold my balance. There was a person on the right-hand side doing their washing. And we got to a point and we went underneath a bridge. And we went underneath this bridge and we met this lady. And this lady on the right-hand side when, she, when we met her had a big bundle of cardboard boxes, unfolded. And she told us that story about how she had to fold a thousand cardboard boxes to make 75 pesos. To give you an idea what 75 pesos is, that's just over one US dollar. She did this to survive. She had no other choice. And for me, that made me realize two things. See, there's a massive gap right now between the rich and poor. And every year it gets bigger, bigger and bigger. It also made me realize that I could have been one of those kids. I could have lived in the slums, not knowing when I would get my next meal, not knowing where I would sleep. So I made it my mission then that I would go out there and educate as many people as possible to make them understand how lucky they actually are. And in the years to follow, I did a lot of public speaking, community groups, functions, schools, and I wanted to raise awareness to as many people as possible. All I asked in return was a little donation. And with that donation, I, I donated it back to the, to the people I, was, I had done the charity work with to help educate another kid who was in that situation. And then that, it was at that point that I met the love of my life, Angelica. See, Angelica is an adoptee as well. We met through an inter-country adoption uh, group that our families were involved in. And if you ask her, she said we met it when she was four years old. And as we moved forward as an adopted couple, we had to face multiple issues. Issues of trust, fear, rejection, control. See, I had a problem with control. Because I was adopted and I was abandoned at the moment I was born, if I couldn't control it, I, I felt lost. I had trust issues. I had trust issues when we were younger, when Angelica would go out with her girlfriends, and I'd, in my head, I would wonder, is she cheating on me? Is something going on? What's happening at this party? But what was happening there was it wasn't the, the it was got to do with the primal wound. You know? As a result of this, she broke up with me multiple times. And I remember with, when she broke up with me, it, it's that fear of rejection and abandonment came in. See, I worked in hospitality. So I had to be, I had to have a smile on my face all the time. So as I, as I would be serving tables and then we would get into night shift, I remember feeling like I was dying inside. Like someone had just come in and ripped out my soul but I had to put on that smiling face. I'm happy to say that we're still together now. And I would like to fast forward six years. Fast forward to six years to when Angelica was giving birth to our, our first daughter, Kiara. This was one of the most amazing times of my life. And, I, and if there are parents on this call, you would understand. Amazing times, and it was also one of the worst times. For me, the most amazing time was that the joy of being a father 
And especially as an adoptee, being a father, being able to hold my daughter, it was like a new page in my life had been, been flipped. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. But at the same time, it was also the worst time of my life. I remember when um, Angelic was having contractions and pushing out Kiara. Kiara's head was in the 90th, 90th percentile, so it was massive. So what happened is they had to do a little incision for, for Kiara to be able to come out. And I remember holding Kiara in my hands and being able and cutting that umbilical cord. I remember the feeling, it used to feel, it, it was such an, it's a real feeling. But at the same time, I remember hearing this dripping sound. Dripping and gushing sound. In the room, there were heaps of people. And if you've ever been to a hospital, behind every bed, there is a red button. And that red button, when they push it, that's for an emergency. I remember hearing that gushing sound and someone going and hitting that red button. Because what was happening there is Angelic was losing a lot of blood. So it was the worst, it was one of the best and worst times of my life. Best time because I had my daughter. Worst time I was about to lose my, the love of my life. See, the moment it flashed through my head is that I could have been a single father with a minute year old baby in my hands. And it made me realize how lucky I was, not just because I was adopted, not just because I was becoming a father, but it was a culmination of things. And, it, and, it, and, and I think for me, later on, the doctor said to me, because they rushed her away, so later on, they, they said to me, they go, if Angelica lose 400 grams worth more of blood, she would have been dead. See, she lost two litres worth of blood for them to, to be able to, to stabilise her. So holding this baby in my hand and, and wondering, not knowing what thoughts are going through my head, everything's happening so fast. I had to be the rock for my family. Hours later, they, they released Angelica. She was extremely tired from 13 hours of labor, having lost two liters worth of blood. She was lucky to be alive. And I think she was, she was a fighter. She had that fighting spirit, but she was a fighter the moment she was adopted. Six months later, at the age of 24, we found out we were pregnant again. This time we were having twins. I remember telling them my parents the news and they, they didn't, we were joking around before and going, yeah, we might be pregnant because it, previously Angelica was very tired. And I remember them doing the scan on Angelica's tummy. And we had Kiara at that time, she was six months old. She was running around and they scanned and they found one baby and they said, hang on, let's just move it across and see if there's, a, there's a, you haven't got a twins here. They scanned it across and we had twins. I called my parents. They were on holidays in the Philippines. They didn't believe me. They, I remember them having to sit down and, and say, I'm lucky I'm lying in my bed. So you guys, And I know I want to try and share this. Uh, on. This technology. So you guys, this is my family. Angelica on the left, Kiara in the middle, Elena, one of the twins being held by Angelica, and Marley, the other twin being held in my arms. I'm so gifted to be able to share this story with you. I'm so lucky to be standing here right now. See, as an adoptee and, and, and a, as an adoptee and a father of three, and at that time I was a father of three under the age of three, 
and an individual who had to deal with trials and tribulations over, him, over my life and through identifying my primal runes. I made a promise to myself that I would never forget where I came from, who I am and where I'm going. And I, as a reminder, I created these wounds, except these were external. These wounds were, were created as a reminder. They sit on the left-hand side of my arm and go halfway down the left-hand side of my back. These wounds are in the form of tattoos. And they, they were a reminder to tell me that I had a higher calling in life. And to use my experiences to empower others and tell them that, that, that your past does not define your future. And in saying that, I want to leave you with, with one video that I, I made when I was 15 years old to raise awareness of the inequality in life. So I'm going to stop my... Are we, are we still recording? That was powerful, Joe. Thank you for sharing that. No, thank you. That was that was really beautiful, Joe. Are, will, right. you, will you be showing any more stuff for us? Uh, no, sorry, I'll just turn that off. I thought that was done. No, you're fine. No, that's everything. That's everything. That was really really beautiful. Thank you so much for showing sharing your story with us, Joe. It's uh. It's really profound. Um, gentlemen, do you have any questions for Joe? Any comments? Joe, where do you currently live right now? Uh, Melbourne, Australia. Okay, okay. And do you still get a chance to go uh, with all the travel restrictions with COVID and stuff like that? Do you still get a chance to go to the Philippines at all? Um, we used to go back every three years. Um, we took my kids back. I want, I want them to have the same as what I had, is just be connected to, to where we come from and always know where your roots are. Um, but um, obviously with COVID-19, it's, uh, it's prevented that a lot. Mm. But, um, it's not going to prevent, for, for us, it's not going to prevent uh, what we're wanting to do in the Philippines in terms of uh, helping in, the people in need right now. So, okay. And last question, what exactly are you looking to do moving forward? What is, what is your big audacious, hairy goal? Uh, my vision moving forward is um, to create, it's, it's not just in the Philippines, but I think um, the main thing is, is creating awareness um, with, with people about how lucky we are, um, whether it be you walk down the street and help um, the homeless people down the street, you're making a difference. And so um, I've got a project that I'll be working on with a couple of friends of mine moving forward. And I think it's a big thing that we're wanting to do, but essentially what we're wanting to do is create a, create, get a block of land and, um, and be able to create jobs um, and, become, and bring them to become self-sustainable and move them into the community, whether they're, they're homeless, whether they're integrating into, into society, um, just being that platform, whether through either hospitality and using our network to be able to bridge that, that issue that we're facing in society right now with homeless and people who are underprivileged. Yeah, you and James need to connect ASAP. Uh, hey, Joe, thank you for sharing, my man. I, uh, I have many, many Filipino friends. I actually ride with a motorcycle club called Philcan, uh, Filipino Canadian Motorcycle Club. So there's like four Caucasians and about 30 Filipinos here in Toronto. All, all Harley dudes, man. They're badass, these guys. It's like, we call them the, the midlife crisis Oakville biker gang. <laughs> it's all like mid, middle-aged men, just the most beautiful people. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in India and um, visiting orphanages as well. So um, I'm right tuned into what you're doing there. Um, also, I love the, the hip hop industry and the scene. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you uh, play in that world. And uh, Vas, who is uh, Sohan's uh, lady, she's also interested in opening up uh, an orphanage. So we've been in discussions around that. So maybe we can bring Sohan back in on the conversation at some point. Uh, do something around, you know, Southeast Asia anyways. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, and uh, Sohan, myself and another contact here in Melbourne, we've, we have started talks 
in doing something on that scale. Um, we want to try and do it in Australia, um, somewhere that's not, is quite hard. Um, I know if in, in Southeast Asia or coming into third world countries, it's a lot easier to implement this sort of stuff. But in Australia, I want the way I'm sort of in the vision that I'm sort of seeing at the moment is, is being able to go, you know, to the government and saying, well, we've got an issue here. You've got homeless people. You've got, you've, we've got a big gap. Um, we can address that issue. And how we're going to address that issue is having this, as I said before to Kelvin, having this block of land getting them back on their feet and I and for them and they're going to see it and obviously the government's going to look at it as, as numbers and they're going to go well this is such a big investment to do but I the way I look at it is it's a big investment for a long-term gain so long do you have a lot of land that you've already looked at are you guys looking at a specific area or no it's just a vision at this stage I um Sohan and I were we were speaking uh, yesterday um, I'll be flying to Australia once all this COVID stuff uh, passes. I'll be staying at his place. Um, and we were thinking about doing a, a business accelerator event, like a personal development type uh, event, uh, Canada, Australia kind of thing. And then I'm going to invite him back this way. Maybe you can join that collective. We could do some sort of a fundraiser and get you your property. That'd be absolutely I'd, I'd be open to that. I'll, I'll donate all my cut. That'd be amazing. We'll talk more. That's so beautiful. We'll definitely, we'll definitely connect. Thank you for that, James. It's always, I love how you're always so up for like collaborating in your generous heart. And um, Joe, I love your vision. That's fantastic. And uh, yeah, just some real powerhouses in here in general, Sohan. And I, I just love to see the collaboration and connection. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Joe, there's different relationships. No, thank you for the opportunity. You're so welcome. It's a, it's a true honor and privilege to have you here with the group and sharing your beautiful heart. Um, so you have an interesting story in regards to the hip hop world and the beautiful relationship. I remember you talked to how you collaborated with some of those um, B-boys in the Philippines, right? Um, so what are the, some of the mm -hmm. relationships in regards to masculinity and the hip hop realm in bridging uh, the two countries? I think I think for me, um, with the with the story about how I connected with them, uh, we were hip hop dancers. We literally just did hip hop dancing when we were coming out of high school, and we used to see these guys on YouTube and go, "Wow, I'd love to be like them. I'd love to meet them." And and um, I just went on Facebook and then added them all on Facebook and connected with them. And before and we I knew here in Australia we have. Um, uh, like it's like uh, at the end of when you finish year 12 everyone goes on holidays or they go and party or something like that and and instead of going partying we went over overseas and that's when I connected with them and said hey guys we're going to the Philippines um, let's connect and I remember one of them reaching out to me and going yeah let's go and then we, we met up and we started dancing with them and and uh, from there onwards we we just built a connection um, a year later, we flew them out to Australia. Um, and they, I remember them telling that story and going, hey, how do, how do we, uh, someone asked them, how do you know Joe? And we go, oh, we, we didn't. We just, we just met him. And the next minute, we're getting flown out to Australia. <laughs> so, but it's amazing how relationships form. And um, I think in answer to uh, the masculinity aspect of things, for, for, uh, for us, like, you know, a lot of us we, we reach out we reach out and want to make that connection and, and sometimes our pride and our masculinity gets in the way of, of wanting to put ourselves on the line and reach out to people like this. Um, and I think with this is you you just gotta put it out there to the universe and allow the universe to receive it and bring it back in. That's beautiful, Joe. Thank you so much for that. Amen to that. Yeah. That's why we're all here, right? Today, getting to Absolutely. reach out all around Absolutely. the world. Absolutely. People connecting each other. And now we have this epic group of men that are here on the call today. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today.